When Fiat took over Chrysler, the company's CEO, Sergio Marchionne, always said one of his goals was to bring the Fiat brand back to the American market. And he's about to make good on that promise. Fiat is signing up a number of Chrysler dealers to start selling Fiats in the U.S. and Canada. Everyone in the business knows the first car in the showrooms will be the little 500. But what else will Fiat start selling here and when? Well, we're going to get to the bottom of those questions because my guest on today's show is Laura Suave, the president of the Fiat brand in North America. And joining me on my journalist panel are Elisa Priddle from the Detroit News and Tim Higgins from Bloomberg. Stay right where you are. We'll be back right after this. From our studios in the Motor City, this is AutoLine. Here now is John McElroy. Welcome to our discussion right now in the studio with Laura Suave, the head of the Fiat brand in North America. And Laura, it's great to have you here on the set of AutoLine. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm excited. Good. And joining us this morning, too, are Elisa Priddle from the Detroit News and Tim Higgins from Bloomberg. Great having the both of you here as well. Thank, Thank you. you. But let's talk Fiat. In okay. fact, when should we expect to see Fiat dealerships and cars in the showrooms? When will people be able to buy these vehicles? They will be able to buy. Actually, they've already bought. We already pre-sold our first 500 Prima Dizione units um, several months ago when we released them online. However, when they can actually pick them up will be first quarter. So First our, quarter, 2011. Correct, 2011. It's a 2012 model, so we will be releasing them in January. And you'll have how many dealers and where mostly in the country? We have actually 135 dealers that will be opening up, and their studios will be ready by March 1st. But again, starting January, they'll be able to start taking orders of the vehicles, and we'll have an online, our online site will be launching um, on November 17th. And this is what, Chrysler dealers who are building separate showrooms or showrooms within showrooms? How does that work? Correct. The majority of them are our Chrysler partners. And so what we did was we had an actual proposal process, and they were our first pick. So they came to us with um, proposals of what they'd like to do with the studio. And we are requiring a separate facility. And when we say facility, it is the showroom. So it is not within the actual building that they currently have our other Chrysler brands, but it can be on the same property. And some of them have found some facilities that have been vacant. So they're going to start from day one ground up and the majority of them are our Chrysler dealers. Is that enough dealers, or do you want to increase that number? We Our plan definitely is enough to get us started, given the first year, um, but we have a phase two plan to continue to grow the brand as we introduce more product. What's that experience going to be like in the showroom? Is it going to be like going into a Chrysler dealership in the past, or is it going to be markedly different? It's going to be different. Um, we were very, very focused on the, the consumer experience and what their requests are, and it's going to be a lot more experiential. So um, we have a design center inside the, the showroom, and that's why we call it the Fiat Studio. This vehicle has got so much customization possibilities, and really the whole fun about it is experiencing how you build it and how you can make it uniquely yours. We have 14 exteriors, 14 interior color combinations, two environments, a whole gamut of different customization techniques. So we want them to spend a lot of time and really build the perfect vehicle for them. So that's going to be the main focus of our showroom. That's been some of the success of the 500 in Europe. Is absolutely, the absolutely. And again, it gets back to making it yours and not kind of being run of the mill and fitting in with everybody else. You can really make this vehicle exactly what you'd like it to be. Um, and, and as you pick your dealers, I mean, they sort of have to get themselves together fairly quickly. So Very. I just found out, <laughs> you know, deliveries are going to start, I mean, as early as the end of next yes. month. So um, is, is there, how much leeway are you giving them to be able to get all set up and, like you say, have a, a separate facility um, if they need building permits? Yep. There's so many things involved. How do, you, how do you sort of give them the leeway they need? And the perfect part is that the number is very manageable, right? So we have 135 dealers, so we are working with each and every one of them on an individual basis, and we're working within those parameters. So if it's a permitting issue, we're working on alternative plans to help them get going until their facility is fully operational. 
And you actually wanted 165 to start with. So is it a matter of that the last 30, they're just sort of you're just working with them on their plans, and you expect them to be on board by the time you launch in March as well? 165 is actually the markets that we wanted to be covered in. And um, again, some of our dealer partners have multiple locations, so that was how that number kind of worked its way out. But yeah, we are going to continue to work with some of our partners that have a little bit longer term plan. To your point, facility, a full facility that they're building from the ground up is not going to happen in three months. How are you going to market the car? I mean, it's being talked about in this country mainly as the Fiat 500. In Europe, of course, it's known as the Cinquecento, which is Italian for 500. Right. How are you going to market the name in the United States? The Fiat 500, it's funny, I get asked this question a lot. And I, um, not to use another brand, but Chanel number no. 5 is Numero Cinque. So it's really just how you pronounce it. It is the Cinquecento. Um, it's just we pronounce it 500 in the U.S. But I just thought, from a branding standpoint, would you want to use the name Cinquecento? It doesn't sound like you do. We will. We actually will because, again, that's the uniqueness of, of the Fiat 500 here in America. It keeps us um, unique, and we're the only Italian brand that really can play off of those words. So we will be using Cinquecento and kind of educating consumers. It's a tongue twister until you start to play with it a little bit. But tiramisu became a common word in America after, you know, you used it a few times. Volkswagen taught Americans how to say farfignu, so I <laughs> guess you can sure tra did. train them to say trinkelchenta. Exactly. <laughs> well, and to that point, you're going to be reintroducing Fiat into the U.S. And yes. It, what kind of challenge is that for, uh, for the company? Fiat's been out of the U.S. for about 30 years, uh, leaving you know, you kind of what the impression of fix it again, Tony, is kind of the stereotype of it. How do you get past that, and, and do current customers remember that? We ha it's interesting because we've done a ton of research, of course, and um, any younger generation, has n they really don't have a, a memory of Fiat. And so for them, it's a cool brand. It's something new. Um, younger generations are much more open to new brands also. And then we show them the car, and they're like, wow, that's pretty cool. It's stylish. Um, and again, and the Italian heritage helps us a lot. And then there's this other group of passionate, passionate Fiat followers, and they've had Fiat, and they still have Fiat today and they've kept their cars running even though we haven't been in the country and they've really kept the brand alive so they're our biggest fans and they're ecstatic that we're coming back. So do you treat it as an all new brand or a rejuvenation of the old one? I mean which is your... It's an all new brand because really Fiat in Turin is also an all new brand. I mean the Fiat that we launched in 2007 is a new, is a new brand. Who do, you, who do you see buying the 500? I mean, who's going to be the customer? Yeah, there, this is great. So um, this particular vehicle, it stretches on, in such a huge age difference and gender. It's not very specific. So it's so broad and appealing to such a large group of people. It's more of a lifestyle. So this is, again, about people that are open to new brands. They appreciate Italian items, whether it's Italian art, Italian clothing, Italian style and design, and are looking for something new and different. Now, you're not looking at big volume to start with, aren't you looking at maybe 50,000, 60,000 in the U.S. or so? That's it, actually for U.S. and Canada, 50,000 oh, so units, Canada. correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it, it's not an expensive vehicle also. We're looking at, what, 15,000, 16,000? We haven't announced starting. our pricing yet. Uh, but so, so how do you, is it a profitable vehicle to start with, or what does it... What does it bring to the table? Yep, it absolutely is a profitable vehicle, and that's a great question because we had to obviously build the business case for our dealer partners to be willing to invest in the brand. So it is a profitable vehicle for both um, Chrysler Group and for our dealer network. Fifty to 60,000 actually sounds like a huge number to me. And the reason I say that is, isn't that about what Mini's sales mm -hmm. are these days? And Mini's been at it for quite a while, yep. and they have multiple models. What makes you think you can sell 50,000 Cinquecentos in the United States and Canada? Well, the segment's growing. So by 2014, this small car segment is going to double. So we already know that the piece of the pie is getting considerably larger. And then there's also the alternative. We are an alternative that hasn't been in this segment for a really long time. Um, Mini's a great vehicle, and they've been at it, to your point, for a very long time. They're also considerably more expensive than we are. And then you have your appliance-like vehicles in the segment that don't really have a lot of style or technology in them. So we can cover that space that will deliver both emotionally and rationally at a great great value. Well, a base mini is not all that expensive. If you want to get a John Cooper's Works, you yeah. can easily pay $38,000 for it. They'll happily take your money for that. You're, of course, going to be selling a high-performance version of the, the Cinquecento, the Abarth brand Correct. one. 
What are you going to be doing price-wise with that? I got to imagine you'll chase some pricing with that model. That one's not coming out till 2012, so we're going to start to see the market with the uh, Cinquecento and the Cabrio for 2011. But you see a way of really making some money with the Avart. Yeah. And then at the Detroit Auto Show this year, we saw an electric version of yes. the 500. Mm -hmm. When might we see that? That will also be coming out 2012, fourth quarter. So we are working actively um, on the electrification program, and we actually have our prototypes out, out and about. Would that be full electric or would that be some kind of hybrid mix? It's a full electric vehicle. <laughs> and you've got a new battery supplier you just announced this we week? We did. We just announced our battery supplier and we are slowly going to be making announcements of the rest of our um, partners. Let's go back to the Mini and, and, and smart cars. These vehicles were introduced in the U.S. market recently. Yep. Uh, have you learned any lessons from them about introducing a new brand, especially a small vehicle, into the U.S.? Yep. I think there's still some concerns with American consumers on small cars. We're just not used to them, although we do, again, see the trends changing. Um, Safety is unbelievably important to the consumers, which this vehicle, will, which the Cinquecento, will deliver on. And also, um, it gets back to a product pipeline. We just talked about four cars that in less than two years we will be bringing into the Fiat showroom. It is important for a new brand to continue to have product news to remain relevant. So when you talk about your numbers of the fifty to 60,000 initially, but the segment doubling, does that mean Correct. you expect then by 2014 that are you going to double your sales at that point too? We anticipate taking a bigger piece of the pie, not necessarily in doubling our share. <laughs> but I, I guess that gets to the question of, of where you see Fiat in the next uh, you know, five years or so. These are essentially a, uh, di di uh, you know, different versions of the 500. Correct. Are, is there going to be other Fiat vehicles in the brand here in the U.S.? We are working on a future product plan past 2012 that will continue to expand again the portfolio. And I, I want to come back to that in a moment, but first, how are you going to position the Fiat brand? Is this, you know, inexpensive? Is it a super fuel economy? Is it European and Italian styling particular? How do you position the brand right. in the U.S. now? We can, again, I've talked a little bit about the, the blending of the emotional and the rational, right? So we can deliver on the emotion from the Italianness. There's not another Italian brand that you can buy in the U.S. today, unless you have $100,000 or more. Um, and it's also, again, the fuel efficiency is going to be important to us, and it's the uniqueness. This is getting back to the personalization of this. This is a vehicle that you can really make very uniquely yours and not have to go out and spend a lot of money. You can do it right there in the showroom. But if you had to use just a couple of words, you would say Fiat brand is? It is a stylish Italian small car brand. Okay. That, that, that's pretty good there. Um, and I also understand that in Europe, the Cinquecento is not sold with an automatic transmission. Correct. And most Americans don't know how to drive a manual, so you must have adjusted this car for North America. We had to. That was, again, one of the biggest things. It's perfect because we're starting with a great product, but there's some considerations that we had to make making sure that it's going to be successful for the U.S. consumer. We have different driving habits, and one of them is we like our automatics. Um, so we worked really hard, and we developed a six-speed automatic transmission that is going to be available here in the United States. Um, along with that transmission, we had to add armrests because when you're shifting, you're using your right hand. When you're not, there's kind of like this empty space and you're not sure what to do with it. And there's just a lot of other little things in the vehicle that we've done um, to make sure, again, it is perfectly built for the U.S. consumer. Now, were there some growing pains as they were testing some of the automatics that they were showing you? <laughs> there were. <laughs> um, we tried a, a robotized one, and we either had to completely change all American consumers' driving habits and what they expect, or we needed to go out and find a better transmission that worked for us. A little, a little bit of head jerking going <laughs> Just on? Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're here to assure us that the new one is the, Yes, yeah, so we have our solution. It's a full six-speed automatic transmission transmission that works just like you would expect it to in the U.S. You mentioned all different kinds of interior and exterior colors. Yes. Typically, the manufacturing <laughs> guys hate that, you know, because of the complexity that right. it involves. Why did you go with so many colors? And I understand you're going to describe these in Italian, yes. not using English to describe the the colors. So explain both. Okay. You know, um, because uh, I'm sure the manufacturing guys are pulling their hair out over this one. Actually, we're building this in Toluca, which is a really flexible plant. So in the Mexico. reality is, yes, correct. And so that part was easy. Um, the dealers are the ones that are having a little bit more heartburn with this because they're like, how do we stock these things? And you need to tell me, just tell me what combinations work and, you know, what I need to stock to make sure that we sell successfully. And that kind of gets back to the experience with the customer. Let the customer tell you what they want. Um, 
and let them build it and then you know we'll build it for them but we're actually it's it is interesting it's one of the most challenging because of the there's over half a million ways you can build this vehicle wow yeah. and, and why italian italian oh the italian names so um again just to, to distinguish ourselves a little bit more and to continue to insert that italianness into the brand people love to learn different words it is a romantic language so just playful ways with the colors to kind of educate and keep our italian heritage in in the store. Well, give us some examples. What are some of these colors? Well, like rosso for red, nero for black, giallo. So we feel like we're going to, you know, be educating the American consumers and teaching them along the way. Well, and even your trim names are Italian names for the vehicle, are they not? Interestingly enough, our trims are not. Um, in Italy, they use pop, sport, and lounge, which is exactly what we're going to follow. Just again, with the globalization of this product, we want to make sure that there isn't any confusion that they're getting a different product. This is still the Cinquecento. It originated in Turin, and it is the same product that is sold in over 80 countries. So it really sounds like you're going to be asking the customer to kind of pre-order what they want. Mm -hmm. what, what will be the amount of time it takes for it? If I walk in and say I'd like a Fiat 500, yep. how long will it take for me to get that? We are working on getting that shored down with our logistics department, and we're actually looking at regional yards where we can stock a good number of them that the dealer can select from to shorten that distance um, as much as possible. We're still in the works, so we don't have that completely finalized yet, but the goal is to make that happen. We know cons American consumers, unlike Europeans, are impatient though. Their lease is up this weekend and they come into the showroom and expect to walk out with a car. Um, but this is the type of product, I, I, they're not, I don't believe that they're gonna make concessions. They're not gonna take one that's on the lot that's not exactly the way that they want it. How long do you think they're willing to wait? A month? I would say, I would say probably 30 to 45 days is appropriate. Mm -hmm. But you really expect a huge amount of your sales to be done this way? Especially ordering? in the beginning. So what kind of, 75%? We're looking at 60, actually about 60% of them would be orders. Customers are highly influenced by advertising. Yep. So for example, Nissan right now in marketing the Leaf has a blue leaf in all of its ads. Mm -hmm. And the order rate is something, I can't remember the exact number, but it's 70 or 75% being ordered are blue. What colors are you picking for the 500? Because wouldn't that, that tell you a lot as to what people are likely to order? It's interesting that you say that because you're right. The communication color that the manufacturer usually selects is what the dealer orders, which is what the customer gets. So I don't necessarily know if it's that the customer wanted it or it just happened to be the one that the dealer stocks because they were kind of led down that road. Um, our communication color for this um, for the Cinquecento in this market is red. Just getting back to, we're an Italian brand, passion. The red is um, a beautiful- red. Ferrari red. It's not Ferrari <laughs> red, I shouldn't say Ferrari red. Rosso Brillante is actually our red. Um, but it also, our sport model is our velocity. So it's our volume vehicle. And it has a beautiful red brake caliber that picks up on the red exterior and a red ring around the, um, around the wheel, which just kind of all ties it together. But again, this is something that we are gonna be, our online site will show you a million different ways you can customize it and play with it. And along those lines, I just saw in Italy that there is a like a Ferrari edition yes. version of the Cinquecento because I saw the two Formula One drivers for Ferrari, Felipe Masse and, and uh, Alonso. Yeah. Uh, with these, and they were, it was like an outrageous price for this thing. It's the tribute edition. The tribute edition. And what was the price on that? And they can't keep them in stock. They only make very limited numbers, and it's got a high performance engine with the Ferrari badging and but, everything. Uh, what was the price on that? It was like $80,000 or something. Euro. Uh, I think Euro. it's 80,000 Euro. Euro. So, so yeah, it's a to maybe $100,000. Right. right. Are you going to sell that here? We are working on special models to continue to, again, to keep the brand um, exciting and get people in. We don't have that in the current plan yet. But it's something that, trust me, my program team talks about every week. <laughs> <laughs> now, given that you're um, you really centered on the metro markets, is there any kind of contingency for the person who isn't in one of the 120 markets where you're selling it, but really wants to go drive to one of these cities, buy one? Uh, I, can they then go to a Chrysler dealership for service? I mean, what do you do for the people outside the mainstream that still really want to buy themselves a, a Fiat? That actually was one of the biggest pieces of our plan was customer service. So how are you going to manage this for a customers that are interested in either test driving or also servicing the vehicle and maintaining the vehicle once they do purchase it? So all of the proposals that came in um, from our dealer group, they had to have a contingency plan, whether it's a mobile service or a pickup and delivery service. 
Um, having them serviced in the Chrysler showrooms right, or in service departments right now is not an option because again, the special tools that are required and we want to make sure there's a multi-air um, engine inside this 500 that again is going to require unique training and so we just want to make sure that they get the best service possible so we are redirecting them to the Fiat. So studios. someone who drives to the big city to buy one and then lives three hours away they don't have any options for for service. The, the dealer has back to the the dealer has a plan to take care of that again through our service department, and when they take care of it, it's seamless to the customer. So they'll come and pick up and drop off. Or there's again, each of the dealers had a, a specific proposal, and the only way that we selected them was to make sure that they had a great contingency plan to service their customers. So there's been some really creative, actually some really creative proposals that they submitted with even mobile trailers going out, and they do the service right on site. Or again, we'll drop off a car, take care of it, bring you back, and bring it back when it's done. And have you picked your Canadian dealers? The yeah. Canadian dealers, yes, um, are also in the process, and we're at about 40 right now, and he's got a few more to to finalize. What, what's your total that you want for Canada? 50 to 60, again through through the final phase. To start off, though, we're we're in the bigger cities where we are. Um, we've covered our markets where we know we're going to have the greatest potential to start. You're the head of the Fiat brand in North America. How far out does that brand go? And the reason I'm asking is there's been talk of a couple of commercial vehicles coming over here. The Ducato, big giant van, yep. the Doblo, small, sort of like the, the Ford Transit Connect. Would that be part of the Fiat brand or would that go to Ram? I would manage anything that has the Fiat badge on it. So depending on what those vehicles actually come across and in which brand they fit into. Do you think that you do more than passenger vehicles and get into the commercial market with Fiat? Um, at this point, again, it's not something that we have in our in our short term plan, but it's you know always an option. Now, talk to us a little bit. You alluded to this the small engine that's going to be in this vehicle. That's going to be built in the U.S. Correct. And has production begun on that? The 1.4 liter engine is actually being built in um, our Gemma plant in Dundee, mm -hmm. and we have started production. And that's important because that's one of the milestones for trying to increase Fiat's ownership in Chrysler, right? Um, well, it was just, again, finding the right places to build the product, right, mm -hmm. where the efficiencies are, where the skill set is, and, and it just worked out that it happened to be in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a key uh, thing these days is not to build parts and components and cars in euros and sell them in dollars, but to try to get as much uh, of the car made right. in North America so you're it's not possible. as affected by currency changes. Correct. And it's always difficult when just the fluctuation of whether it's a yen or the, or the euro of when you're bringing the vehicles over. So as much as you can kind of control those costs within North America, it just is, it's more beneficial to the consumer in the end because then you can have a, a level set price. Besides which, I think there's two engine modules at Dundee, one of which was sitting empty. So it was a no-brainer to put that engine in that plant. Right, and it's great to have the capacity um, in these plants that, you know, that we can. We can tool them up. We can create jobs here in Michigan. And, and again, it's just a win-win for everybody. So as you're the, the sort of lone Fiat person in Auburn Hills with all of the Chrysler people, how much integration, how are you viewed in Auburn Hills? I'm actually a Chrysler employee. So that is the, you know, Fiat is a brand within Chrysler. And even though I carry the Italian flag in, in the meetings and my, my role is to um, protect the Fiat brand and keep it consistent around the world. I mean, that's best brands are always consistent no matter where they are. And so I, I have the best interest of the Fiat brand from a European perspective, but I am a Chrysler employee. So um, it's challenging some days, but again, we're working as, this is a great partnership and um, everyone is just wanting to succeed. So there's the best of both companies really coming together. You know, one of the things with our plant is the world-class manufacturing, that it's Chrysler's plant, but Fiat brought over the world-class manufacturing process that we've installed inside our plant in Toluca. But a lot of the preparation for the vehicle itself to make it meet North American specs, this is, was this all done? By our engineering in, team in Chrysler, correct, in Auburn Hills, okay. correct. But, but you're obviously going to Italy a lot, though, to... Yes, we go back and forth quite a bit. Um, we love video conferencing. <laughs> our design studios actually are the ones that are really um, on a daily basis working together because, again, we really want to maintain the Italianness of the brand and um, the designers are working with the Italian designers to just keep the integrity of the Cinquecento, keep you know, all of our future product always having that Italian flair, but also making them 
you know, perfect for the American consumer. So that's where there's a lot of collaboration. But you have your own little area in the design dome that's just Fiat, or no, no, our it's a though? it's a big group. <laughs> uh, we do have a dedicated designer um, a team. There's a team, but they all kind of collaborate together. And this is a fun project to work on, especially some of the special editions. Um, our teams are going crazy coming with, up with some with models. That, we're going to have to wrap it up. We're out of time. But okay. Nora Suave, thanks so much for coming in. Oh, you're Alisa, welcome. Tim, great having the both of you here, too. And Thank I will be back in a moment with some closing thoughts. I think Fiat has awfully ambitious goals for selling the Cinquecento in the American market. It took many years to build its sales up to 50000 a year. Can Fiat hit that sales rate right out of the box? I know automakers say the small car market is going to expand a lot over the next few years, but I'm not convinced it's going to grow as much as they think it will. After all, the American market is shifting away from cars and back towards pickups, SUVs, and crossovers. Unless we see a big spike in gasoline prices, I'm afraid automakers are going to have a hard time selling the small cars in the numbers they need to to meet the government's fuel economy standards. As I've said before, you can force automakers to build small cars, but you can't force consumers to buy them. Anyway, join us back here again next week for a deep dive inside what's going on with cars and the people who make them.